Jerusalem for a special edition of The World with me, Yalda Hakim. Tonight, the former head of intelligence at Israel's spy agency tells me targeting Iran's nuclear facilities is not off the table. So it's now fair game. Anything and everything is on the table, including targeting no, nuclear no facilities? No doubt. Everything is on the table right now. Including targeting nuclear facilities? Including everything. Today, Tehran showcased its military might as the president warned the tiniest move from Israel would bring a fierce response. We'll speak to Palestinian refugees in Lebanon exhausted by conflict and who now fear a regional war is inevitable. And, uh, is it a Let them respond. The Israelis are only a tool of the Americans in the UK and France. That's as Iranian-backed Hezbollah launched another attack across the Israeli border. Coming up, we'll have a special report assessing the weaponry and defence capabilities of both sides. Plus, why has there been record flooding in the United Arab Emirates? This is what happens when 18 months of rain falls in a single day. So is cloud seeding really to blame? And 100 days to go until the Olympics. We'll be live in Paris to explain why the Games are becoming a security headache. That's all coming up on The World with me, Yalda Hekin. Good evening, live from Jerusalem. In the three days we've been here, the Israeli president has been holding counsel with his war cabinet, trying to decide how and when to respond to a wave of Iranian attacks. Today, we heard one of the starkest assessments yet of what the government here may be considering. It came from the man who used to be head of intelligence for Mossad, the Israeli spy agency. Zohar Palti told me nothing nothing is off the table. That includes hitting nuclear facilities inside Iran. We know that would be incredibly dangerous. In fact, the head of the nuclear watchdog told me exactly that yesterday. So when might we see some sort of retaliation? What weapons could Israel and Iran deploy? And just how worried should the world be? We'll be answering all of those questions tonight. Let's get started, though, with our first report from our Middle East correspondent, Alistair Bunkle. Today, in the sort of military parade that regimes love, Iran put on a display of some of the drones and long-range missiles fired at Israel on Saturday night. Iran is on high alert, expecting Israel to strike any day now. The country's leader warned that that would be a mistake. If the tiniest invasion is made by the Zionist regime against our homeland or our interests, the Israelis must be certain that they will face a very harsh response. In Jerusalem, the British Foreign Secretary met with the Israeli Prime Minister. The assumption amongst Western governments now is that Israel will strike back. And so the diplomacy is aimed at limiting the potential consequences of that. Are you any clearer about what Israel plans by way of response. Well, we wanted to demonstrate our solidarity with Israel because it was an appalling attack by Iran. But to be clear, we have repeated our view that any response should be smart uh, and that should be designed in a way that is going to limit and try to de-escalate this conflict. Nobody wants to see this uh, conflict grow and spread. Netanyahu, who has barely been heard of since the weekend attacks on his country, chaired a meeting of the cabinet today. World leaders have also all types of suggestions and advice. I appreciate it, but I want to make clear that we will make our own decisions and the state of Israel will do all that is needed to defend itself. The crisis with Iran might have briefly distracted from the ongoing war in Gaza, but the hostage crisis remains unresolved and many people are losing patience with a leader they don't trust. Although many Israelis would support a retaliation against Iran, a significant number here are still opposed to the Netanyahu government and blame them for not getting the hostages in Gaza home yet. In Gaza, more humanitarian aid is finally getting in, but there is still a problem with distributing it, especially to the north. The fighting also continues, and fears of an invasion of Rafah remain. 
Israel is still unable to win and extricate itself from one war, but might be on the brink of starting another. Alistair Bungle, Sky News in Jerusalem. Well, we've been talking about a possible response from Israel all week. Today, the former director of intelligence at the Israeli spy agency Mossad told me targeting nuclear facilities in Iran is not off the table. He started by describing why the government is taking the attack so seriously. Just have a listen. It's the first time ever that the Iranian from their soil are taking directly more than 300 what we call air breather, that's mean ballistic missiles, UAVs, cruise missiles, democratic country, that they don't have any border with us. And uh, it seems to me that the Iranian this time revealed the truth phrases that they are very dangerous entity, that if God forbid one day they will have a military nuclear capability, imagine to yourself what will happen to the free world. What have you learned from this event? That they have no red lines. They wanted to kill as much Israeli as they can. Thank God for the outstanding cutting edge technology that we and the Americans have that have the ability to intercept almost everything over here. By the way, huge operation, shoulder to shoulder of the free democratic countries in the world that came and stood by uh, to protect the states of Israel and to help us to protect the states of Israel. Of course, the Americans, the Brits, France, some other countries over, over here in the region. And that is what the world is waiting and watching. The world is, uh, and global leaders, the, the partners of Israel are calling for restraint. They're saying, de-escalate this situation. You've been in every one of these rooms for, for decades. You've been part of every major decision when it's come to intelligence and security for Israel. What are you advising and, and telling your, um, your colleagues now who are making these big decisions? It's okay to wait for the time and the right moment when we will feel that we will hit something significant and not just something not relevant to say that we retaliate just because uh, everybody wants to close this issue. I want to leave this account open and to strike and to do something that will be significant that the Iranian will understand, don't mess with Israelis. Simple as that. And for the international community, I don't remember that after Pearl Harbor or other attacks in the history, somebody restrains uh, someone. And uh, we didn't uh, done nothing against Iran's soil per se, uh, overtly. And it seems to me that there will be an implication for that. When and where, we will choose the place. Would you say within in Iran, now on Iranian soil? First of all, I don't know. After I'm saying that, I don't know. My suggestion would be, of course. So it's now fair game. Anything and everything is on the table, including targeting no, nuclear no facilities? No doubt. Everything is on the table right now. Including targeting nuclear facilities? Including everything. No limitation for nothing right now. Are you not concerned that that could lead to all-out war, a kind of war that the West, your American partners, are saying they don't want to see? And, and if Israel does that, President Biden has said that, you know, America will not be taking part in that. Israel is not the issue over here. Israel is facing since October 7, and even before. The fact that we've done it, you know, by ourselves all the time. We are in a rough neighborhood over here. We have some really, really problematic neighbors over here that are not accepting the fact that we have the right to live in this neighborhood quietly. Are you disappointed that Prime Minister Netanyahu hasn't addressed the nation at all after such a major attack on this country? My personal uh, thinking regarding the Prime Minister is irrelevant. It's a free country. This country will have to decide what will be the consequences of this government after October 7 and after what we faced in April 14. It's a matter of time that there will be election again over here. As you know, we have kind of 14 and we like to do election from time to time. Uh, it seems to me that the public opinion will have to decide. There's been a lot of 
frustration, certainly from the Americans, towards Prime Minister Netanyahu about the situation in Gaza. Do you believe that this Iran uh, attack, while it is an issue that Israel needs to deal with, is a distraction from the issue of Gaza and the fact that uh, attention is moving away from Gaza and, and, and how to deal with, with the, the number of things in Gaza, the, the fact that there is famine in Gaza, the fact that the international community is saying Israel needs to do more? So I don't think that there is a famine in Gaza. I think that there is a lot of uh, exaggeration over here. By the I, Americans sure. and aid agencies? and By everybody, but nevertheless, the responsibility is on us. We needed to do a better job regarding how to supply more humanitarian aid to Gaza. That was my personal opinion for months over here. I have to be fair that most of the public opinion in Israel not sharing my thought. We understood that we have to do better, and it seems to me in the last two, three weeks, mainly after President Biden uh, pushed so hard, uh, to push more humanitarian aid to Gaza. We're on the right track right now. There is hundreds and thousands of trucks like every day that is coming from Israel or from all over and the international community, and it seems to me it's okay. Regarding your question, yes. We let Hamas to grow up as a terror organization since we left Gaza in 2007. There is no IDF in Gaza for so many years, 16 years, 17 years. No settlements in Gaza. The only thing that we got in return is Qassam missiles and vicious attacks against civilians inside Israel. Uh, Hamas military capability, terrorist capability have to be destroyed completely. We need to smash them and that's exactly what we will do. We can't speak after October 7 immediately about two-state solution, but as a vision or something like that, no problem to speak about it and it's a good uh, but for the time being, this is not on the cards. There are some who believe that um, Israel needs to respond to Iran before Passover. Do you, are you of that view? I'm not in a view to rush and to do some big things just like that out of the sleeves. We need to prepare it. We need to plan it. We need to find the right target. And it's okay that the Iranian will be a bit under anxiety. It's fine. It's okay. It's good to everybody. And we will retaliate on the day and the time that we will choose. I'm not under any pressure or any stress. We don't have to do it before Passover. It's like in four days. And if we will do it, it's fine. And if not, it's also fine. That was Zohar Palti, the ex-Mossad director of intelligence. Well, with me now is my colleague, uh, international affairs editor Dominic Waghorn. And Dominic, Zohar Palti held one of the most sensitive and important positions in Israel. Um, he is a respected strategist and tactician. He's talking about a very serious and dangerous move, saying everything's on the table, including the nuclear facilities, and this is very alarming. He is. He's a, he's a very experienced uh, intelligence uh, commander and previous uh, field officer intelligence. Um, he is someone who's held a number of key positions at very high levels in military and intelligence uh, arenas for Israel, and he's somebody who would say is cool, calm and calculating. He's not a kind of gung-ho, uh, not at the gung-ho end of, of Israeli military um, or intelligence. He's someone who was pretty critical of the fact that Israel stayed in Lebanon for too long. He said that was because of dumb slogans, presumably has a kind of suspicion of politicians as a result. Also uh, kind of led uh, the group within the intelligence circles we now know uh, who were uh, opposed to a hasty, over hasty uh, attempt or plan to attack Iran that sort of cropped up over the years historically uh, in Israel because you know, there were those pushing for an attack on Iran because of its nuclear facilities. He urged to pull back from that. But yet today in that interview, he's saying nothing is off the table, including an attack on Iran's nuclear facilities, which I think gives a pretty clear idea um, where even people from his end of the argument, traditionally and historically, are looking at this, that Israel has to do something, also has to keep its enemies uh, guessing, has got to um, play a longer game. So while he's saying that nuclear facilities could be attacked, he's also saying that, Amer that Israel should kind of bide its time, keep its powder dry and keep the enemy uh, guessing. But he's, he, that interview gives a very clear sense, I think, of what's at stake as the Israeli Prime Minister makes his decision about what to do next. 
Okay, Dom, thank you so much for your analysis, and we will be speaking to you uh, a little later in the program. Now, if you ask anyone in the region, the worst that could happen, one answer, would be the violence spreading beyond Israel, Iran and Gaza. Well, as Iran-backed groups like Hezbollah continue their attacks in the region, our special correspondent, Alex Crawford, has been hearing from Palestinian refugees who have no hope of peace. Here's her report. Southern Lebanon is already at war and under Israeli attack. These are some of the latest, filmed by the Israeli military. There's been a worrying spike in cross-border exchanges over the past few days, with Hezbollah too sending a volley of strikes inside Israel. The militant group said this community centre was an IDF base. This is it from another angle. There were multiple injuries. Israel said they included civilians. It's led to increased urgency from those inside Lebanon as the Israeli government ponders how or whether to respond to Iran's weekend drone and missile attacks. It'll be a huge risk for Israel because it'll lead to a big war in the region. It won't be limited to Lebanon. It'll definitely spread to Yemen and most probably to the Syrian Golan. And the situation will be out of control of any international power and very bad for the region. In the Lebanese camps filled with Palestinians who fled their homes in previous Israeli wars, there's more frustration than fear at what they see as Western double standards. And, uh, is it the Let them respond, this man says, referring to the Israelis. The Israelis are only a tool of the Americans and take their orders from the US, UK and France, he says. The alleyways of Shatila camp are held by different Palestinian political factions, but the onslaught over the border has brought them together. Even two to three generations on, a lot of these people still consider themselves refugees. They're exhausted by war, but they don't fear a retaliation. They don't fear an escalation. In fact, many of them actively encourage it because they see it as the only route to finally possibly an end to this war and being able to return to where they came from. And that is the nub. Without a Palestinian state, they believe here and in the Lebanese government that there can be no peace. The memory of PLO leader Yasser Arafat, who brought them closest to peace in generations, still looms large here. And the PLO leader in the camp appealed to British people to help them. And I tell to Britain once that the struggle is not against terrorism. It's uh, against... Uh, Palestinian rights. The Iranian-backed Hezbollah militia is a powerful force in Lebanon, stronger than the Lebanese army and embedded in Lebanese politics. Taking them on is very different to tackling Hamas in Gaza. Hezbollah form a very strong part of the axis of resistance, which includes the Yemeni Houthis, Iraqi Hezbollah and groups in Syria. And any Israeli retaliation risks drawing all of them in. These are intensely worrying times for those in the region, with many feeling that every day there's a step closer to all-out regional war. Alex Crawford, Sky News in Beirut. Well, today Lebanon's foreign minister told Sky News he fears a wider war in the Middle East. Abdullah Abu Habib spoke to Alex in Beirut. Have a listen. We're worried, of course, and we wish that they will succeed because any kind of retaliation or uh, any kind of revenge is going to end up with a bigger war, probably. And I think, you know, uh, if the Israeli attack on the consulate of Iran in Damascus has been, you know, condemned by the United Nations, not as much would have been happened later. That's what the Iranians said, at least. But now, Again, if they are going to attack the Israelis, there's going to be revenge, and therefore may Lebanon and Syria and Jordan may be in very big trouble. We pray for a ceasefire, but the United Nations is not moving in this direction. And if they move in this direction, you'll see us, you know, most probably, you'll see us supporting it. Hezbollah, the Hezbollah leadership here in Lebanon, welcomed the Iranian attack against Israel, which has led to this position that you are now in. What's your position? What's the Lebanese government's position? We want really peace. We really... But did you, do you welcome the attack I like, don't, like no, Hezbollah we, did? We don't welcome and we don't also denounce the attack. 
because he, That's a Israel difficult started, position to be in, isn't yes, it? Yes, a very difficult position because Israel started it and we wished it was condemned, but it wasn't. So we really wish for peace. The Lebanese, most of the Lebanese, 90 percent of the Lebanese want peace. And the only peace that can come is from the United Nations Security Council. And they are not acting. That's Lebanon's uh, foreign minister there. Well, stay with me because coming up, we'll hear from Israel's ambassador to the UK. Zippy Hotaveli sounded a warning to Europe and told me now is the time to be hard on Iran. You'll hear more in the next few minutes. The RNLI saved my three daughters' lives, and without them, they would not be here today. So what happened? They went to a shipwreck in Brancaster. Um, they walked out, the tide came around them, and then someone swam to shore to get some help, and the RNLI came out, and Daisy was still holding on to the boy, and Molly and Zoe had drifted off. And when like spoke to him the next day, obviously went there to say thank you. They said without the R and L, they wouldn't they wouldn't be here. They literally had seconds. We thought, oh, we can get back. Um, and then as we started crossing, it then was like so deep and the tide was so strong. It was like, oh, can't get back. Um, and so we had to like hold on to this sort of like um, boy, uh, boy, what was that? A terrible translation, blah. Um, and so it felt like ages that we were like holding on to it. Um, and I remember because I was quite young, I was really freaking out. I was like screaming. I was like, we're not going to make it because where the people from the beach being so far away, I wasn't sure if they'd seen us. So we couldn't like communicate with them because they were too far away to be able to hear them. And so like nobody's coming. Um, I was just so scared. And uh, when as soon as I saw the RNA light break coming, I was just so relieved because like, it's OK. Someone's going to save us. It's fine. How proud are, are you of your mum? I'm really proud of her, yeah, because um, I know she's been, like, practising really hard and working. Because, like, obviously it's not something she normally does. She's never run a marathon before. She's never done any type of, like, official proper run before. Like, she's not a runner. Um, and so I can see how hard she's been working with the fundraising as well. She's been, like, really trying and I'm, like, really proud that she's doing that. Welcome back to this special edition of The World with me, Yalda Hakim from Jerusalem. Well, last night we discussed whether Britain needed its own Iron Dome. There's no doubt the heightened security threat has got Western governments thinking twice about their ability to defend themselves. Israel's ambassador to the UK, Zippy Hotaveli, travelled to Jerusalem with Foreign Secretary David Cameron. She told me the UK should be on guard and that those very same missiles launched by Iran have the potential to reach London.
We are very, very proud of the very strong and close bilateral relationship that was presented at this incredible coalition on Saturday night. So part of the fact the Iranian failed from the attempt to kill thousands of Israelis with their missiles, with their drones, with their suicide drones, uh, was the fact the coalition managed to basically make sure that those missiles won't get in the country. So if people are amazed from the fact so many missiles being thrown on Israel and barely no, uh, you know, damage and uh, the people of Israel are safe. It's just because one reason, they didn't hit Israel, most of them. And, and just imagine how things would have looked if the, the missile that our defense secretary was showing to the world, defense minister Gallant was showing to the world, this is a five-story size, 18 meters. This is huge missile, and think about it, you know, falling in the middle of a city like Jerusalem. We're now in beautiful scenery of Jerusalem, but look how populated it is. Just think about it, um, you know, hitting neighborhoods and people and children. It would have been a disaster. It's so clear that Israel needs to show here an act of deterrence to the Iranians. So the game is deterrence. The Iranians say, and I know you're going to say it wasn't a diplomatic compound, because that's what we've been hearing from the uh, Israeli side in the last few days. But it's widely believed that a diplomatic compound in uh, Damascus was hit on April the 1st. So Iran is saying it's responding to that. I can guarantee you it wasn't a diplomatic facilities. And honestly, when we're thinking about what Iran was doing, they're the last the last country in the world that can speak about a violation of diplomatic uh, respect because they heated our embassy in Buenos Aires. Um, they were the one who were hitting again and again Jewish communities around the world. And, and think about uh, the horrible terror attacks in Burgas in Bulgaria uh, that killed uh, so many Israelis. Think about the Jewish community in Argentina. All those acts of violence were committed by Iran. So you, we need to remember that. And at the same time, they're targeting the UK. So your MI5 was saying, the head of MI5, that they were planning to kill and to assassinate people on UK soil. What should Israel do now? You've been with the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu today. What is the discussion that's being had? Uh, I think next is sanctions. Uh, when you're thinking about Iran, um, I think for the last um, two years, there was a little bit of, of uh, uh, impression the Iranians were getting from the world. Go ahead, you, you're going to get um, um, your, your economy will get back uh, to, to where it was, and we're planning on, on you know, creating more and more uh, arrangements and things to remind me the appeasement uh, back then uh, that was uh, a big failure policy, big failed policy. So the world was appeasing Iran and it's time for us to stop that. So this is the time to be hard on Iran. So there are many diplomatic ways to do that. And obviously, whatever the World Cabinet will decide, this is for the World Cabinet. There's a diplomat, I can tell you, the world can do much more. And I know that the Americans, including the UK government, together are planning more of a sanctions regime. So you've talked about uh, the diplomatic route. Uh, today I was speaking to the ex-Mossad director of intelligence. He said everything is, is on the table, uh, including the, you know, the idea of hitting nuclear facilities. Is that the impression you're getting from the conversations you're having with your leadership? I don't get any impression about anything tactical. So no one is, uh, you know, this is, this is one of those things that you need to be a cabinet member in order to be exposed to this information. So I'm not going to say things that um, definitely no one will share it in the media, but I'm just saying personally I'm not aware of the plans being discussed in the moment in the War Cabinet, and I think it's for the War Cabinet to decide. So uh, I think he's an ex-Mossad, so he's not official in any way. So I don't think what he says is what the current people are doing or saying or recommending. This attack happened at the weekend. Um, is Israel likely to respond anytime soon? I think this is not the right question. The right question is how to stop Iran to do this horrible thing again and to do these horrible things to more countries. So the missiles were fired on Israel and the same drones are the ones hitting European soil in Ukraine. And when we're thinking about the range of those missiles, they can get to London. So think about the future of Europe. Think about how they see America as the big Satan and Israel as the small Satan. The whole concept of the Iranian regime is against Western civilization. So it's not against Israel alone. And this is why the coalition was fighting together. And more moderate Arab countries were getting into this coalition. So if you're asking me, the biggest question is how to stop Iran.
Joe Biden, Rishi Sunak, David Cameron, who's been here, Tony Blinken, the U.S. Secretary of State, are urging de-escalation and caution because they are worried this will spill out across the region. Today we uh, interviewed the Lebanese foreign minister who said this will not just be about Lebanon, it'll hit Syria, it'll go to Yemen. This will spread across the region. So again, who's, who's the... The, the main head of the octopus that is creating this major de-escalation. -esca this is Iran, and Israel wants to de-escalate. We, we, we have no interest, believe me, we didn't choose the 7th of October war. The 7th of October war came because Hamas invaded, butchered, killed, and raped our women and children. And this is really the time for us to look at the regime and to say, this is the regime that killed Masa Amini, that is executing hundreds of people every year. No other country in the world is doing that on, on this, this type of, of brutality, total violation of, of, of human rights, and, and keeps on hiding behind those proxies. The mosque was, was off on Saturday night, and it's time to the world to address this problem seriously. Ambassador, I have to ask you about the situation in Gaza. Just in the last few days, we've also now heard another U.S. official, Samantha Power, describe the situation as famine. The U.N. has described it as famine. They say it, there's a looming humanitarian crisis. What is Israel going to do now to resolve the issue in, in Gaza so that the people there don't continue to suffer? So actually, one of the positive things that um, the, um, Secretary Cameron was speaking about was the fact that Israel is doing so many efforts on the humanitarian aid issue. So Israel doubled and tripled the amount of um, trucks that are getting into the Gaza Strip. Distribution issue was always the main problem. So it wasn't just about aid getting in, it was also whether it's going to be distributed and getting to the right hands. And Hamas was main part of the problem because they were taking over the aid. The aid didn't get to the right hands of the people. And now we're doing our best to, to make sure that the distribution will, will improve as well. But there is one thing I can guarantee Israel is doing a lot on, on the humanitarian aid issue. So Israel's ambassador to the UK speaking to me a little earlier. Well, as I said, you heard the ambassador's warning to Europe there and her description of Tehran's weaponry. Well, Iran launched 300 drones on Saturday, but how much more do they have in their arsenal? And will Israel be able to defend itself? Our data and forensics correspondent, Tom Cheshire, has been speaking to the experts about what could happen next. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has vowed to retaliate against Iran following an assault involving more than 300 missiles and drones. Washington has urged caution, but Tehran says is ready for further escalation. Here's what Israel has at its disposal and how Iran could defend itself. The option that Israel is most likely to be considering, according to experts, is an airstrike on critical Iranian infrastructure. This could include its nuclear facilities. Iran doesn't openly pursue a nuclear weapons program, but several sites have been reported as having the potential for helping develop nuclear weapons. Israel is well equipped for such an operation. The country has 39 state-of-the-art F-35s, the fifth largest infantry in the world. So they have F-35 stealth fighters, and there have been reports that these have been used to penetrate Iranian airspace before, not uh, for combat mission, but just for reconnaissance. Alternatively, Israel might choose to respond to Iran's ballistic missile attack with ground launch missiles of its own. But it's unclear whether Israel has the capabilities to launch a similar attack. There isn't much information out there about Israel's highly classified ballistic missile program called Jericho. Iran has at least 42 long-range air defense missile launchers, including 32 Russian-made S-300 launchers. Iran acquired the S-300s in 2016, but experts say the S-300 might not be as effective as Iran had hoped because the Israeli Air Force has been trained in evading the missile. So Iran is now investing in developing its own systems. The Hordad-15 is the latest operational domestic surface-to-air missile system under the command of Iran's elite revolutionary guards. Last year, Iran said it had increased the system's tracking range to 180 kilometers and its attack range to 120 kilometers. The upgraded system, called Tactical Hunter, is reportedly defended by its own short-range missile system. Having these capabilities, is it the same as being able to effectively stop an Israeli assault? Probably not. The attack may also have given Israel a better idea of Iran's offensive capabilities. Missiles used in the attack by Iran included the Hadda, first tested in 2004, and the Ahmad-1, 
Both missiles have a range of around 1,500 to 1,600 kilometers, putting all of Israel well within their sights. Another weapon in their arsenal might be the Fatah, an Iranian-designed missile. Weapons experts say it's designed to beat Israeli air defenses. The Horam Shara is another Iranian missile that's reportedly still under development. It's impossible to know how these weapons will perform against Israel's air defense systems until they're actually used. Israel has a host of tried and tested air defense systems. The Iron Dome, Israel's short-range system, can intercept missiles within 70 kilometers. It's frequently used to defend against missiles fired by Palestinian and Lebanese militants. Two other systems, Arrow and David's Sling, are capable of intercepting ballistic missiles at much further distances. If Iran wants to overwhelm these air defences, it's likely to rely on its key ally Hezbollah, which is estimated to have more than 150,000 missiles in its arsenal, according to the CIA. Experts say that, ultimately, it could come down to attrition. In other words, someone is going to run out of missiles first. But as there's limited information about what each side has, it's just a question of who and when. Well, let's bring uh, Dominic back in for some more analysis. And Dominic, we've, for the last few days since this attack, been hearing about the fact that Israel launched these missiles, these drones, but it was all theatric. Some military analysts have been saying this, but, but it was an attempt to, to do some serious damage. Yeah, and I think that was borne out by what we saw yesterday, that, that huge missile, and when you stood next to it, you realised that uh, to talk of a symbolic attack really was not t hitting the mark. Um, and I think uh, responding to that is one challenge for the Israeli government, but also it's got to uh, make up for the deficit in deterrence, not just in terms of the kind of military deterrence, but also the intelligence deterrence. A lot of uh, commentary on the right of Israeli politics and the media saying, actually, this was a the, the attack on the embassy compound, diplomatic facility, whatever we want to call it, uh, was another intelligence failure after the intelligence failure Octo of October the 7th because it didn't anticipate what Iran uh, did as, as, as its follow-up. Um, it clearly didn't advise the Israeli government, if, if you hit this compound, um, we could end up with the first state-on-state -state attack on Israel for more than 30 years. The assumption is if they had advised that, they may have thought twice about hitting uh, the compound. Um, but also, I think the other fear is what the Iranians learned from Saturday night in terms of all that missile technology that Tom was talking about there, that they've been developing, they've been testing, but they've not been able to use in anger. Now they've been able to see what it does against Israel, how far it gets, what the Israelis and the Americans and, the, and Western states and some Arab states have to, um, to prevent and preempt it. All of that is very useful intelligence for the Iranians. So for all those reasons, they've got to hit back. Is the, I think the consensus here, it's a question of how uh, and when they do so. Yeah. And, and yet, you know, as ever, Israelis always sort of put on a tough front, don't they? We heard the ambassador there, the ex-Mossad chief, saying, you know, we'll do it when we're, when we're ready and we'll, we'll be hard. We heard Netanyahu as well pushing a little bit back on the international community, saying, thanks for your advice and counsel, but we'll do it our way. Yeah, it kind of sounds dismissive, doesn't it? On the day that David Cameron comes here, but also Annalena Baerbock, the German foreign minister, they come here and in the light, echoing basically what Joe Biden has said to the Israelis, don't overreach don't plunge the region into a much bigger war. Don't jeopardise this big coalition, this unprecedented coalition that fought back that night. Um, and uh, Netanyahu just says, look, we're getting all sorts of suggestions and advice. I'm going to decide when we do it and, and, and how uh, we do it. Now, I think it's very important to realise that in the psyche of, of Israel, it's absolutely essential for an Israeli prime minister to take ownership of such an important decision. If he appears to take a decision um, influenced and, and pressed upon by, even by his allies, he could look weak. So that's another reason why we might see, even though they say that they've decided what they're going to do, the war cabinet, to give it some time so that when it actually happens, it looks like it was the decision uh, unilaterally of the Israeli government not listening to, uh, to allies, not listening also to the Iranians who today warned that the, the, the smallest, I think, the, the smallest, the tiniest invasion, they said, will lead to a harsh and massive response. He doesn't want, want to look as though he has launched any limited attack, uh, fearful of that. So that's another reason why we might see a retaliation after Passover week, which is what was hinted at yesterday by his chief of staff. Passover is just in the next few days. Um, Dom, thank you so much uh, for all of that. This is The World with me, Yalda Hakim. Next up, why record-breaking rainfall is bringing chaos to the UAE. And could security fears mean big changes to this year's Olympic opening ceremony?
Welcome back. Let's turn our attention to the United Arab Emirates now, where the heaviest rainfall ever recorded has caused significant damage. Severe storms have also brought huge disruption to global air travel as airports across the region were forced to cancel hundreds of flights. Our science correspondent Thomas Moore reports on the unusual weather conditions. The land of sand has become a world of water. At Dubai airport, planes ploughed through floods as intense thunderstorms brought the most extreme rainfall on record and there were reports of several deaths. So this is not a time lapse, this is real. I've never seen this much lightning in my life before. This is crazy. One region just south of the city had 25 centimetres of rain in just one day. The average in Dubai is less than 10 centimetres over an entire year. Water cascaded through luxury malls, flowed through metro stations and submerged streets. One cat had a lucky escape. So much rain in such a dry country has led to speculation that it was caused by cloud seeding. The United Arab Emirates regularly sends planes into clouds to scatter tiny particles in the hope that they will draw together moisture and form raindrops. But not this time, said the authorities, and a British scientist says it was a natural weather event turbocharged by climate change. It was a well-predicted storm. People knew there would be severe rain. Most severe rainfall events occur because uh, weather systems get stuck. And indeed, this, this was a strongly developing but also slowly moving system. And it sort of all accumulates then. And we were unlucky that it accumulates over heavily populated areas in this case. Amman too was badly hit by the storm with people plucked from the torrents. The region normally receives so little rain that drains aren't built for so much water and there is more wet weather to come. Thomas Moore, Sky News. Let's go to France now, and 100 days to go until the start of the Paris Olympics. Organisers say they're confident everything will be ready on time. However, there's now uncertainty around the opening ceremony after President Macron warned it could be moved because of security issues. Our sports correspondent Rob Harris reports from Paris. The elite unit of the French police storming a boat on the Seine. This is the Olympic training usually unseen. Their target are men threatening the lives of potential passengers. These attack simulations preparing for the most ambitious opening ceremony in Olympic history. Athletes parading for the public like this, down the river on boats rather than walking around a stadium. A vast extravaganza adding to the security challenge for France and protecting athletes, the top priority for the boss of Team GB. I mean, I'm clear that I'm concerned. It's, it's one of the most important things that we have to manage from a risk perspective. Our security team that work very closely with us on a day-to-day -day basis, they then engage with all of the British security and intelligence services. Are you concerned about this opening ceremony being in the open air? Yeah, I mean, I think everyone knows that that is clearly a risky environment. All that stuff they would expect is happening to make it as safe as it can be. And I, I'm confident it will be safe. Armed personnel, a familiar sight at Paris landmarks. And they'll be supported by British police who are being deployed here for the Games. The French government had been insistent for months they would stick with the unprecedented open air opening ceremony. But the language has been shifting and now they're talking about alternatives. And one of them is having the ceremony just here around the Trocadero site. France is now on a maximum terror alert, the level raised after the Islamic State group claimed responsibility for attacks on a Moscow music venue last month. Plans ever-changing for those forming crisis management strategies for companies ahead of the Olympics. The uh, security services are foiling attempts all the time. So the threat is there, but you really should look into other threats as well. And of course the cyber threat, which is in, really in everybody's minds, uh, because uh, the best way to uh, make the Olympic look bad is uh, by uh, using some type of uh, a cyber attack on uh, public displays. France securing systems brace for cyber attacks from hostile states. While across Paris, temporary venues are being readied. 
Iconic backdrops for a summer when France wants the spotlight on the sport. That will require the biggest security operation in the country's history being assembled over the next 100 days. And Rob uh, joins us live now. And Rob, I mean, the security concerns continue. We're also hearing reports that there's an attempt to ban Israel from international football. Yes, Sky News has just learned that at the FIFA Congress next month, the issue of whether Israel should be banned from international football is due to be on the agenda. I've seen a copy of a Palestinian Football Association motion that calls for football associations around the world to impose sanctions on Israel. They're referencing attacks on football facilities during Israel's war on Gaza, the deaths of football figures and the silence, as they say, from the Israeli Football Association on the uh, atrocities as they see it taking place. Now, the Israeli FA previously told me they think FIFA should stay out of politics and UEFA, the European governing body, have said that they recognise that this is a very different situation from, say, the ban on Russia from international football, given how this war started with those Hamas attacks on Israel on October the 7th. But this is set to be a hugely divisive issue at the FIFA Congress in Thailand next month, with several Middle Eastern nations, as broken already by Sky News, calling for Israel to be banned from football. Rob, uh, thank you so much uh, for all of that. Now, coming up on the programme, the multi-billion uh, billion funding package for Ukraine and Israel. President Biden wants to provide more than $80 billion to fund both conflicts, but will politicians in Washington back his plans? That's coming up. So my dad's a magician, so um, I started because of my dad. Pretty much, when I was born, my dad grabbed me and brought me straight to the theatre because he wanted me to be a magician. <laughs> uh, do you want to see something then? Yeah, definitely. So, so today, sh you can't tell no one this, I'm going to tell you the secrets of the magic circle. OK. Shh, you can't tell no one. Um, my lips okay, are sealed. So here we've got a deck of cards. So just say stop for me. Stop. Put it there. So uh, take the card, don't okay. show me. Now, it doesn't matter if I see it, because right now I'm going to show you how the trick is done. OK. So you're going to get a little massive. Oh, fine. Class. OK. You can't tell the magic circle, I don't want to get kicked out. OK. So normally, when the people have got the card, I grab a little pen and I like to draw a little door. I'm not good at drawing. <laughs> Could be a window, but we'll go with it. Yeah. <laughs> OK. So, a little door. And the thing that I'll do, I'll probably fix this up a bit. And... Um, the thing that I do is, while, they're at, while I'm asking for you, for you to look for the deck, yeah. um, I do this secretly when no okay. one's looking. And the thing that I do is... Uh, ooh, there's one card there. I, um, I grab the card. I yep. do like I put it in the middle, but I'm actually putting it on the bottom of the deck. OK. And then, uh, so, seven of diamonds, it doesn't matter if I see it, I put right. it on the bottom. So, what does that mean? When, they, when I slide the, box, the cards back inside of the box, yeah. <laughs> I got a little peeky peeky. OK. Do you get what I mean? Mm. Look, watch. Little peeky peeky. Stop it. Can I see yeah, that? Yeah, go on, have a little peeky peeky. Peeky peeky. That is an actual door. I had my nails done because I knew we were getting, doing <laughs> a card and trick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, so the worst part about this trick is if they ask to examine the box. OK. Because you're like, oh, I've got a door on the box, what should I do? Yeah. Well, I'm a real magician and I never break the rules of the magic circle. Stop it. Let me have a look at that. Have a look, have a look. Examine it. There's nothing there. I can do a quick trick. Have you got, is that sugar over there? Yeah. Or your cup of tea? Give me, pass me over your sugar. See, really, in my cup of teas, I prefer sugar cubes. Yeah. Uh, so put your hand out for me quickly. OK. I'm going to pull this out. Watch this. OK, we've got 30 sugar, seconds. Here we go. Two. Oh, sugar there cube. you go, ladies and gentlemen. Remember the name. <laughs> and if you Harry want to follow, if you Merlin want to... Piper. That's my name on Instagram. I'm Katie Spencer and I'm Sky News' arts and entertainment correspondent. Uh, Maverick here on the red carpet. I'm so excited, Hello, Tom Cruise. You? Katie Spencer, Sky News in London.
Welcome back. We've been focusing on war in the Middle East, but now let's turn to war in Europe. That's because politicians in Washington are finally set to vote on a multi-billion dollar package of aid for Ukraine and Israel as soon as Saturday. It includes more than $60 billion for Ukraine and $26 billion for Israel. As you can see from the images there, today three missiles hit an eight-storey block of flats in a central part of Chernihiv, uh, which is near the border with Russia and Belarus. At least 61 people, including three children, were wounded. Well, let's go straight to our U.S. correspondent, Mark Stone. And um, Mark, I mean, we just see there uh, the situation in Ukraine. They're so desperate for this aid to get over the line. Yeah, and you know, those images you saw just then of, of Russian missiles uh, penetrating uh, into Ukraine, managing to cause so much damage. Critics of, of, of America's inability to pass this bill would say that America's responsible for this happening because they have uh, not provided Israel with the weapon, sorry, uh, Ukraine with the weapons it needs to be able to shoot down uh, these, um, uh, the, these, these missiles. Uh, and remember, too, that the drones that are going into Ukraine that are damaging Ukrainian cities are made by Iran, the same drones uh, that were in Israeli airspace uh, at the weekend. So there is, there's a geopolitical link here, and I think it certainly links up the fact that finally uh, Congress looks set uh, to pass these bills. Two separate bills, but linked certainly. Israel, uh, $26 billion worth of, of, of lethal aid, as it's known, uh, and Ukraine, a whopping $60 billion uh, worth of lethal aid, which genuinely, I think, will Will, uh, uh, certainly those people on the Ukrainian side of all this will hope will change the tide because there's no doubt that over the course of the past year, Russia has got the upper hand and that is linked with the fact uh, that Israel, uh, that sorry, that Ukraine has been unable to have the weaponry to fight back. Yeah, and just briefly, um, uh, Mark, I mean, here I am in Israel and they're mulling and discussing the idea of potential war with, with Iran. So they would also be pushing from their side and, and lobbying to, to try and um, unlock those, uh, those aid, that aid. I've only got 30 seconds. Yeah, look, the aid, it has been, it's been what? Look, I've been looking, 480 days since America was last able to send uh, lethal aid, weapons to Ukraine. So this will make a big, big difference. So say those who've been pushing for this. Yeah, it, 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 indeed. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for that. Well, thank you so much for watching The World. We'll be uh, back again tomorrow night. For now, good night, and the news at 10 is next.